You know the story of Jesus. He was crucified. What happened after that? Well, he was raised from the dead, the resurrection of the dead. Was he raised from the dead? There are many who doubted Jesus' resurrection. Matthew tells us about this in his gospel. Remember, Jesus was crucified on a Friday and uh, his body was taken down after he died. And then Matthew picks up the story in his gospel. The next day on the Sabbath, Saturday, the leading priests and Pharisees went to see Pilate. They told him, Sir, we remember what that deceiver, Jesus, once said while he was still alive. After three days I will rise from the dead. So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and then telling everyone he was raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worse off than we were at first. Pilate replied, Take guards and secure it the best you can. So they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Sometime later, after this happened, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priests what had happened. A meeting with the elders was called, and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. They told the soldiers, You must say, Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping, and they stole his body. If the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said what they were told to say. Their story spread widely among the Jews, and they still tell it today. It was all a hoax. The disciples took Jesus' body. It never happened. And many did not believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead, denied that he had been raised from the dead. What do you think about today? Do most people believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? A large percentage of our population confess to be Christians. I think many people do believe in the resurrection of, the de uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And there are certainly those who do not believe. But whether a person believes or not in the resurrection, I don't think it makes much difference in their day-to-day -day life. What is the truth? Was Jesus raised from the dead? Or wasn't he? And does it matter what the truth is? I think in our culture today, it really doesn't matter. There's no such thing as truth, at least when it comes to God and religion. There's just faith, and faith is antithetical to truth. There's your truth and there's my truth. Whatever you believe is what's true for you and what I believe is what's true for me. You believe what seems good to you, what works for you, what's meaningful to you. I might agree with that, I might not. I have my own truth, perhaps. No one is right and no one is wrong. We live in a culture where all religions are considered true because none of them are considered true. Now I want you to keep that in mind as we go on and we look at John's Gospel. We're coming to the end of that Gospel. We'll begin with chapter 19 verse 38 and go to the end of chapter 20. There are 21 chapters in John's Gospel. This is where John talks about 
Jesus' resurrection from the dead. As we read, as we go through this, I want you to think about what are the things that John includes in his account of the resurrection? What are the things that he omits that you might have expected him to include? And why is it that he includes what he does or omits what he does? Let me pick up reading. John 19, verse 38. Afterward, that is after Jesus had died, afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. He brought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Following Jewish burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body with the spices in long sheets of linen cloth. The place of crucifixion was near a garden where there was a new tomb never used before. And so, because it was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. So John talks, starts off by talking about Joseph and Nicodemus. They are the ones who took the body. Interestingly, in the other Gospels, Joseph and Nicodemus, where they're mentioned, are spoken of rather highly as committed, devoted disciples of Jesus. But in John's Gospel, he seems to do just the opposite. He mentions specifically that Joseph was a secret disciple because he feared the Jewish leaders. And of Nicodemus, he notes of all the things he could have noted about Nicodemus, if he wanted to note something, he notes that Nicodemus was the one who came to Jesus at night, seemingly because he was fearful that he might be seen and somehow associated with Jesus. I think the point is this. John is emphasizing these are two eyewitnesses, two participants who didn't have an agenda who maybe were not the most committed uh, disciples of Jesus, not the kind who would fabricate a story or be part of perpetrating a hoax. You have to wonder why it is that none of the 12 came to get Jesus' body. When John the Baptist was beheaded, Matthew mentions that it was his disciples who came and got his body. That makes sense. That's what you would expect. But in this case, Jesus' d disciples, who are accused of perpetrating a hoax, perhaps, are not the ones who come to get the body of Jesus. Let's go on. Early on Sunday morning, so Jesus is crucified on Friday. We were just talking about Saturday when they came and got the body and put it in the tomb. And now early Sunday morning, John is known in his gospel for giving us a lot of time indicators. That's indicative of the fact, and as we'll see in a little bit as we go on, that John is very careful about his gospel. He wants it to be accurate, and so he includes a number of timestamps like this one. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, and John refers to himself in his gospel as the other disciple. So it's John here, Peter and John. And let me also just pause and note, this is very different, isn't it, than Matthew's account where he talks about the angels who came, who were, whose faces were like lightning and who, uh, uh, with an earthquake, moved away the stone. But we see none of that if I could use the word embellishment in John's account, just the facts. 
So she, Mary, ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, John, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, They have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple, John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings, wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus, uh, Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the, the disciple who had reached the tomb first, John, also went in. And he saw and believed, for until then they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. So Mary, Peter, and John find the tomb empty. As I kind of mentioned already, or as I think you can you notice, John's account reads very much like a police report of witnesses' accounts to an incident that happened. Very little embellishment, unusual, but just very little, very few details given. Just what the witnesses say and do. The emphasis is they are reliable eyewitnesses. What they encountered, what they saw, was unexpected. They found it difficult to believe. So it wasn't just wish fulfillment that we had here or their imaginations running wild. They simply reported what they had seen. It's unlikely that this is a scam perpetrated by the disciples. Let's go on in John's account. Back to Mary. And apparently, Mary, after the disciples has left, goes back to the tomb. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stopped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her, who are you looking for? She thought he was a gardener, sir, she said. If you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave him his message. Jesus now appears to Mary. It's both miraculous and very physical. The angels are there. The angels speak to Mary. She's apparently so overcome, so distraught that she speaks to the angels as if they're just regular people. Jesus appears again. Apparently she's so distraught. She's so convinced that Jesus is dead that even though she talks to him, even though he's physically Jesus, the Jesus she knows, he do she doesn't recognize him. But he appears in a physical body. And again, it's something so totally unexpected, totally out of her realm of possibility, that she doesn't recognize him. Finally, he speaks to her in such a way that she identifies him himself. 
or she under she realizes that it is Jesus and she believes and then she reports what she has seen even though she doesn't really know how to process it doesn't really know how to respond to all that has happened let's go on that Sunday evening the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Jesus appears to his disciples. They're behind locked doors. They're afraid. Does that sound like a group of disciples who are perpetrating a hoax? Jesus proves that he is physically risen from the dead. He still has the wounds that are proof, and he appears in a real body, though miraculous. He just appears among them. He sends them out, and he empowers them to do what he sends them to do. Jesus is not just a, a ghost. Let's read on. One of the 12 disciples, disciples Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, We have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Doubting Thomas, he refused to believe unless he physically touched Jesus. He refused to believe in the resurrection. And Jesus very graciously, and John records that for us here, appears to them and encourages Thomas to do what is needed for him to believe. Jesus wasn't a ghost. He wasn't an aberration, a figment of their imagination. He physically existed. His wounds were visible. They could touch him. He was with them. He proved to them that they had, he had been raised from the dead. That, I think, is the emphasis if we objectively look at John's recording of what he tells us about the resurrection. He seems to be going out of his way to emphasize that these are eyewitnesses. This is the account. We have experienced Jesus. We did not expect it. We did not remember what the scriptures taught. He has been raised from the dead. The resurrection is true. Does the truth matter? Why would it matter to John so much? Let's suppose it's a fairy tale. If you know the history of the early church, if you know what John and the other disciples went through, you know that they were persecuted. All are reputed to have died violent deaths. Would they be willing to die for a fairy tale, for a hoax? Would they be willing to suffer? I think it's highly unlikely. 
They were willing to suffer and die because they knew it was the truth. John, at the end of his gospel, almost the last verse says this, This disciple, that is John, is the one who testifies to these events and has recorded them here. And we know that his account of these things is accurate. Again, we see the emphasis upon truth and accuracy. Why would he defend the truth? Because first, there were many of those who denied the gospel, who denied that Jesus was raised from the dead. That's why there's such an emphasis on the accuracy and truthfulness of his account. And secondly, truth, he defended truth and truth matters because indeed it is in fact the truth. John, at the end of chapter 20, after he recounts uh, Jesus coming to Thomas and the other disciples and Thomas physically experiencing the risen Christ, John says this as a, as a cap, as a, a summary to his account. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. These are miraculous signs. They are not ends in themselves. They pointed to something beyond. And the Mir miraculous signs that I have recorded for you here are not all of them, but they are sufficient to be a foundation for faith, for trust, that Jesus, in fact, is the fulfillment of the prophesied Messiah. A he has fulfilled the prophecies in Scripture, and therefore he is the Messiah, the Son of God. And that by believing this, by applying this, by trusting in Jesus, you may have life in his name. We have four books that John wrote, or we have his gospel, and we have three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Here's how he opens his first letter, 1st John chapter 1. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim that to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you ha may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. That's the first four verses of First John. Do you see how it correlates with his gospel? This emphasis on what we have seen and heard and touched. And what we have seen and heard and touched is the Son of God, is life itself. These things that we have written about are miraculous signs. They point to who Jesus really is. They are sufficient proof for what John refers to here as faith, or for you to believe that Jesus fulfilled the scriptures, that he is the Messiah. John is not a historian. He's not trying to just get the facts straight, make sure the story is right. He's not just a friend of Jesus wanting to uphold his honor. He's not an adherent to a religion propagating a way of life. 
He is someone who has been gripped by the truth and who has been gripped by a life, a presence, not information, not facts. He experienced Jesus and he is proclaiming the truth, not just um, setting out facts to agree or disagree with, but proclaiming the word of God proclaiming the identity of Jesus in such a way that it can be believed. And believed is not intellectual assent or just agreement. It's not adapting a way of life, the Christian way of life or Christian morals. It's not becoming religious, going to church on Sundays for about an hour. It is life. He is life. And this faith, this belief that John is talking about and proclaiming and advocating here is something that we can enter into, we can engage, we can experience as he did Jesus. Let me go back to just the beginning of his first letter. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. He is the word of life. This one is life itself. He is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father. We proclaim to you so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ so that you may fully share our joy. Do you see the miraculous signs? Do you believe? Have you entered into a, a belief in Jesus that results in the kind of relationship that John describes here? Fellowship with the Father and the Son literally life itself, joy.